How's it going people? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to 10 cheap luxurious cars for under £10,000. That is an insane amount of money to be spending on a luxurious car. Obviously all of these cars could have potential issues with them or all that kind of stuff. They're all second hand but Obviously, at the same time, they've also depreciated pretty heavily in value. So if you're in the market for a luxurious car, these are some of the cheapest you'll be able to get. And when you think that a Rolls Royce is like 250 grand at a bare minimum for a brand new one, and these are under 10 grand, and I'll let you in on a secret as well, one of these cars is actually a Rolls Royce as well. So a Rolls Royce for under 10 grand, you are laughing. I've ordered them from least to most brake horsepower just to reduce bias on my side. And don't forget that I make this from the UK. So if you're in a different country, prices might be slightly different different. Before we begin, if you do enjoy it, do hit the like button. I'd really, really appreciate it and subscribe for more weekly car content. But without further ado, let's get into the video. <laughs> Starting us off at number 10, we have the VW Phaeton, and I can't even continue to talk about this as a luxury car until I mention that it's built on the VW D1 platform, the same one used for the Bentley Continental GT and the Flying Spur. The D platform from VW is generally used for luxury cars though, so this isn't a huge surprise. Though you can of course get a W12 example, which is very much in line with the Greek mythological name, the engine within our price range is the 3 litre V6 turbo diesel engine which puts out 236 brake horsepower and takes the car from north to 60 in 8 seconds on an all wheel drive layout. You'll get a 2010 facelift example for £10,000 or an older example for as little as £4,500 with high mileage. The Phaeton was originally conceived by Ferdinand Peach to get revenge on Mercedes for trying to take on VW in the low cost European marketplace with the A Class. He wanted to hit back with a VW luxury car that would be better engineered than any that you could buy from Mercedes or BMW. There were a set of 10 features the car needed to have, of which only a few were actually made public. Based basically around speed and comfort etc. Whether or not they achieve the job, it does have a classy but simple luxury interior and the general waftiness of a beast. However, a key issue I've seen from owners is the inconsistency of reliability. Some owners have had near perfect examples with no problems, while others have struggled with boot lid wiring issues, injectors, swell flaps and the power steering pump issues. So if you can stomach these potential common problems, this could be a potentially ideal cheap luxury car. Next up, we literally have a Rolls Royce, the company that pretty much defines what a luxury vehicle is. It's the Silver Spirit, which is quite dated given it was first released in 1980 and production ended in 1990. It hosts a 6.8 litre V8 which puts out 240 brake horsepower and it wafts its way to 60 in 9.5 seconds. There are four generations of the car and your £10,000 will only stretch as far as a first or maybe second generation as these have been going up in value slowly over the past few years and £8,000 is about the minimum you can spend. The key differences between these two gens are pretty minor anyway and are mostly just tech or mechanical. The interiors however are mad. Imagine cruising around in one of these, it would be like driving an old stately manner. Though it might not be the most modern version of luxury, it's still a Rolls Royce which is pretty nuts to own for under £10,000 if you think about it. That cheapness does not necessarily extend to the running costs though, and though build quality is very positive, owners suggest keeping a few thousand pounds aside every year as insurance for anything that does fail is important. Small things like coolant and engine oil can be quite expensive too, as these will take 18 litres of the former and just over 9 litres of the latter. But despite its age and running costs, of all the cars in this list, this one has to be the most prestigious badge in terms of luxury and for that reason I had to include it. Now this next one might be quite cheap to buy but it might also come with a few expensive issues. It's the first generation Range Rover Sport with the 3 litre twin turbo diesel V6 engine which puts out 241 brake horsepower to its four wheels taking it to 60 in 9 seconds. This engine took over from the previous far more sluggish 2.7 litre example and is renowned for feeling much more powerful. The Range Rover Sport chassis was actually adapted from the 2004 Discovery 3 and mixes the structural rigidity of a monocoque chassis with the robustness of a separate chassis design for off-roading, which is mixed in with the dynamic response electrohydraulic active anti-roll bars to make cornering much better than you'd expect in a car of this size. I've been in one of these before and I can confirm they're a very nice place to be. The interior is understated but comfortable and you feel like you're almost removed from the rest of the road as a passenger. The Harman Kardon speaker system is also pretty good. They're listed for as little as £8,000 with this engine and 
10 gram will get you a 2010 model with around 100,000 miles on the clock. However, on reliability, it's the electrics which really let these down, with owners suffering all sorts of issues, including them even switching off entirely while driving, which seems quite dangerous. This is even after they record them to remedy some of these issues. This is probably a key factor in why they're so cheap today, so I'd be wary of going for one of these. In seventh, we have the BMW 730D with its 3 litre inline 6 turbo diesel engine, which puts out 241 brake horsepower and does 0 to 60 in 7 seconds. This German executive saloon comes in four versions, the F01 short wheelbase, the F02 long wheelbase, the F03 armored edition and the F04 hybrid. For £10,000 you can expect to get your hands on a 2011 F01 or F02 with around 80,000 miles on the clock or less than 40k if you go for an older example and the minimum you'll find these for is around 7 grand. You might even find an M Sport example for under 10 grand which gives it slightly sportier body and interior finishes. This 7 series was the first BMW vehicle to be produced with rear wheel steering pedestrian recognition for the night vision feature, blind spot monitoring, massage functions in the rear seats and radar cruise control. In terms of luxury, despite being a bad era of interiors for BMW, it's actually pretty nice with the two-tone leather and aluminium or wood features throughout the car. Definitely feels like an executive place to be. The reliability on these is pretty sketchy though, particularly when poorly maintained. As my car mechanic for a dad confirms, unloved ones aren't worth your time. Owners on forums suggest that as long as they service the car regularly, and are up to date with the maintenance, the 7 Series is very reliable though, but the fees for keeping it well maintained are quite high. So if you can stomach that, a fair luxury car to go for, but if not, let's move on to the next one. Another German whip taking 6th in this video is the Mercedes S350 CDI. Now the S-Class is renowned for having the most up-to-date technology Mercedes are willing to provide their customers with, and this car is no exception, but it's not just the tech that this car wins at. The interior has a great use of leather, wood and metal which makes it feel very genuine inside, as well as a relatively large digital display which you can watch films on, and a whole bunch of unnecessary bits like interior lighting, a compartment designed specifically for your sunglasses, and the classic analogue clock on the dashboard, which just give it that certified luxury stamp. It hosts a turbo diesel 3 litre V6 for that extra smooth power delivery of 254 brake horsepower, which gets it from 0 to 60 in 6.9 seconds. It also comes in both long and short wheelbase options like the BMW, and the long is classed as a limousine due to the size, which is pretty cool. These will run you around £7,000 at the bare minimum, but 10 grand will get you a 2011 example with around 70,000 miles on the clock. The key known issue with these is turbo failure due to problems with the seals, but owners are generally very positive about these cars, noting in particular how smoothly they continue to run after years of dailying, which is always a positive sign. This series of S-Class is considered to be a lot more reliable than the previous version too. Overall, one of the more solid picks on this list, with a lot of positives to back it up. Onto the top 5 now, and in 5th we have the Jaguar XJ, or if you fancy a slightly longer version, the Jaguar XJL. It has the same basic 3 litre twin turbocharged V6 engine as the Range Rover Sport, but putting out 271 brake horsepower and taking it from 0 to 60 in 6.2 seconds. Wanted to pause just there for a second and remind you guys that if you're enjoying it so far, do hit the like button as I would massively appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button as well to stay up to date on the two videos I drop every single week and go follow me on Instagram at Cars with JB because I post every single day over there. So if you're not getting enough over here, Instagram every day your guest. More interestingly, it puts out around 600 Nm of torque. I've mentioned before that it was designed by Ian Callum who is hugely respected in the car world, but what I didn't mention was his mindset for the car. He wanted to give it a rebellious edge and make it an interesting car that actually had some decent handling as well as a highly luxurious interior. Again having been in one, the interior is a very nice place to be and I'd probably put it on par with the S-Class. Prices have been coming down pretty fast as of late, with 10 grand bagging you one with around 90,000 miles on the clock, while the minimum you'll find these listed for is around £7,000. There are some major pitfalls when it comes to reliability on these though, like the main bearing failing which requires a new engine and turbos if any metal gets sucked through. There aren't many small issues though which is a positive, although electrics remain a potential issue. Basically, as long as you don't expect maintenance costs to be cheap, it's a beaut of a car. I know this will please one or two of my diehard Lexus fan viewers, but it would have been rude to have made this list and ignored the GS450H with its 3.5 litre V6 hybrid setup. 
which means you can get to escape that savage congestion charge and a bit of luxury if you live around London like I do. That V6 hybrid setup puts out around 341 brake horsepower and takes the car to 60 in 5.7 seconds. The single most interesting thing about this car in my opinion is that the engine block is actually vacuum cast to ensure there are no imperfections and it's received numerous awards for this as well as high praise from owners. It's generally considered to be bulletproof. The engine is so flexible that the 450h actually featured as a race car in the 2006 24 hours of Tokaido in Japan, making it the first hybrid to ever be introduced into this event. When it comes to luxury, it's a very sizable car with all the classic interior features like a nice luxurious set of materials used throughout and heated memory seats just to keep your butt happy. On price, these sit at a minimum of around £3,000, but your £10,000 will get you on with around 60,000 miles on the clock, so relatively reasonable compared to other cars in this list, especially when you see how many have done more than 200,000 miles. I think the clever person watching this video would probably buy this car. Kicking off the top three, we have yet another German entry with the first generation Porsche Cayenne S. For £10,000, you can grab yourself the updated 4.8 litre V8 engine, which puts out 379 brake horsepower and takes the car from 0 to 60 in 6.6 .6 seconds. Not bad for a car of its size. It will have around 90,000 miles on the clock for this kind of cash, or you could get a model with more mileage for around £7,000. It's a very comfortable car to cruise around in and comes with all the nice features you'd expect of a Porsche, plus it's obviously highly practical for carrying stuff around and given its mammoth size. The most interesting thing about this car is the strategy behind why Porsche actually made it, which I couldn't explain better to you now than I did when I first did this research back at the start of 2019. It also turned out that two thirds of Porsche owners at the time owned at least two other cars, and one was usually an SUV. This gave Porsche the opportunity to gain a greater market share of those other cars owned by Porsche owners, which is exactly what happened. It acts as a hedge against the sports car market dipping again in the future. It helped Porsche pay its $128 million debt and amass a 2.1 billion cash flow very decent. This engine isn't renowned for its economy however, so if you're worried about running costs, might be worth getting a diesel instead. On reliability there are a few known problems too, particularly related to the electricals, so do be wary of this, as Porsche maintenance and repair costs aren't cheap. But this is the car that saved Porsche, and to own a nice big luxurious Porsche for under 10 grand is a bit of a steal. I feel that this car appears pretty regularly on cheap luxury car lists, and with good reason, it's a Maserati. The Quattroporte to be exact, hosting the 4.2 litre V8 Ferrari and Maserati collab engine that puts out 394 brake horsepower and takes the car from 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. The engine is the same lineage as the F430, California and the 458, so a pretty cool block to be owning for under 10 grand. The most ideal feature about this car is the number of different specs it came in from factory, meaning that you really should spend some time hunting for the right one in the spec you'd prefer. From what I can basically understand, the more Trident logos, the more expensive it was when it left the factory. That said, they are starting to go up in value having been at rock bottom for quite some time, so might need to get in there quick. You can pick one of these up for as little as £9,000, I've seen them listed at £6,000 just earlier this year, while £10,000 will get you in with under 70,000 miles on the clock. It's not renowned for reliability though, with the variators being the key issue noted by owners. Irrespective, any issues the car has are likely to burn a nice hole in your wallet given it's a Maserati with a Ferrari engine. Either way, if you want one, I'd say they're worth keeping for the long haul, as the rising values speak for themselves, as does the sound. If you thought having a Ferrari collab engine was cool in a luxury car, you might be even more interested in the 5.2 litre V10 that sits in the Audi S8, which puts out 443 brake horsepower and takes from 0 to 60 in 4.9 seconds. <laughs> People love to mention that this is the same engine you'd find in the Gallardo, but this isn't entirely correct as there are some key differences between them, so you couldn't just swap them over and expect the same performance. For one, the S8 engine is tuned to be correct for a nice luxury cruiser, not a supercar. It's actually quite sporty given it's an S-line with sports seats, stiffened suspension and Brembo ceramic brakes as an option. It's actually quite sleeper-esque in my opinion too, as I feel like many people wouldn't really know what it is and just see an executive Audi. And don't let that sporty 
happiness for you. The powerful engine will keep you wafting for miles, although obviously the economy isn't so great. These have sat at pretty much the same value for a couple of years now, with £9,000 being around the minimum you'll find them listed for, and 10 grand getting with around 100,000 miles on the clock. The key issues I could find include carbon buildup, which requires a full carbon clean, and timing chain tension is wearing over time, which is a complete engine out job, and therefore quite expensive. In addition, there are smaller electrical and suspension related issues, which can still work out to be expensive if they happen en masse. I reckon this is a good car for future values, however, as people will come to see them as classics at some point or another, so it might be worth getting in there sooner. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave me a comment down below to let me know your thoughts. Let me know your thoughts on which cars you think you'd go for or which you wouldn't go for, whether all of these are lemons, whether they're not lemons. If you've got an experience of owning them, I'd massively appreciate it in the comments down below. Also, if you wanna hear more of my voice, then I've recently gotten a Lima or a Limor account. If you go over to the app Limor, then you'll find me on there making really short podcasts where I just chat really casually about topics. I just thought it would be a cool thing to start talking about stuff, but I didn't wanna put it on my YouTube channel, so I've done it over there. But anyway, a massive thank you to the patrons as always and to you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Listen.